Before we jump into this week's episode, I want to tell you about a masterclass I'll be teaching on November 13th. This masterclass is all about overcoming airplane anxiety. And maybe for you, just the thought of getting on a dang airplane makes you feel incredibly anxious. Maybe it brings up feelings of, I can't even imagine being stuck and trapped on an airplane. What if I experience a ton of anxiety or the symptoms or a panic attack? Or what if I have a medical event? Or what if I get on the flight but I can't get back home? Or what if I have to go to the bathroom? Or what if I throw up? And the list goes on and on, right? Trust me, I get it. And then your brain throws at you all those past experiences of getting on an airplane and it's like, "Mm, don't do it, don't even think about it. So in this class, I'm going to teach you lots of simple and practical tips and tools that will actually help you to experience more peace and freedom about booking the flight, getting on the flight, and being far from home. So if you have an upcoming flight you're feeling really anxious about, or if you've really been wanting to book a flight but have been too anxious about doing it, this class is for you. Simply head to the link in the show notes to sign up, and if you sign up by October 27th, you'll get a really special discount. I hope to see you there. Welcome to a Healthy Push podcast. I'm Shannon Jackson, former anxiety sufferer turned adventure mom and anxiety recovery coach. I struggled with anxiety, panic disorder, and agoraphobia for 15 years. And now I help people to push past the stuff that I used to struggle with. Each week, I'll be sharing real and honest conversations along with actionable and practical steps that you can take to help you push past your anxious thoughts, the symptoms, panic, and fears. Welcome. You're right where you're meant to be. Okay. I am excited because we have a panic to be student here. And I feel like it's been a while since I've done one of these. So I have Angel with me and Angel took Panic to Peace over the summer. And so I'm really excited for her to just be here and share her story. And we'll sort of just dive into whatever comes up. So Angel, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here talking with you. All right. Let's just start with who the heck is Angel? Tell us a little bit about you. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so I am 37 years old, um, born and raised in South Louisiana, um, moved around a little bit, but, um, yeah, for the most part, I have always lived here. Um, I have a wonderful husband named Jamie and three dogs that keep me super busy. (laughs) Um, I love to bake. I love to read. Um, I love to be outside as well. So I do a lot of walking, enjoy hiking, not a ton in Louisiana, but, um, on vacation (laughs) and when we lived in Colorado. Um, so yeah, I love to be outside. Um, yeah, I first heard about you actually on Jenna Overbaugh's podcast, all the hard things. Um, and you did an interview on there with her and I resonated so much with your story. It was kind of the first time I think I ever felt like truly validated, um, Mm -hmm. And truly, like, I had heard someone that had been through what I've been through. Um, And so, yeah, that's how I found you. And then started following you on Instagram and watching your videos and then decided to take Panic to Peace. Ah, that's so cool. And, like, we were literally just talking about this, right, that, you know, coming on and sharing your story, it's, of course, intimidating, but – no matter what, right, we dive into and what's discussed, it's just so helpful for people struggling to know, like to truly know they're not alone. And that when more people share their stories, we get this, okay, like I'm actually not alone. There are people who are, have struggled with this for a long time and like getting all that hope and oh, it's just so good. So I know you've had quite a long journey with anxiety, (laughs) so let's dive into it. Like where, where did anxiety pop up for you? I should say when, like, what did it look like? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so true. Um, it's definitely a little intimidating to share my story, but I'm really hoping that it can help someone kind of like your story really helped me. And even the other panic to peace students I've heard on the podcast have been hugely helpful. Um, just to know you're not alone. And people are struggling in the same way you are. Um, But yeah, so I have struggled with anxiety since I was a child. Um, It, of course, when I was a kid, I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't really have 
parents that were maybe aware of what to do with me and kind of what was going on. And so therapy wasn't really something I did as a child. Um, when I was in high school, I was having panic attacks almost every single day in school. Again, not knowing what it was, just knowing that it was extremely uncomfortable. And I really, really disliked school. <laughs> and then in college, College was probably one of the lowest points with struggling. Um, sitting through a class or taking a test was nearly impossible. So I was panicking probably, I mean, I wouldn't say every day, but it was it was often. Um, and it wasn't anxiety over like, am I going to pass a test or fail a test? It was anxiety of, can I sit through this without panicking and feeling like I need to run out? Um I also always had to park like really close to my buildings because like my car was kind of a safe space for me. Um, not always because I definitely had panic attacks in the car. <laughs> but when I was at school, which I was commuting to school, um, it was definitely my safe place from like feeling like if I need to run out of a classroom or a building, I knew that I could go there and feel a little bit better. Um so yeah, I would say one of the lowest points was probably when I was in college and I um, went to go take a walk one day and I couldn't leave the driveway. Um, I remember like I got to the end of the driveway and immediately felt that like intense panic. And that was really, really it was scary, but it was discouraging because like I love to walk and jog and run and to feel like confined to my house at that point was just really, it was really sad and really scary. Um, so that's when I first went to therapy, um, after that. And I remember my best friend came with me cause I was so anxious to go to therapy. She came and I went in by myself, but she came with me, which was really sweet. Um, and then I kind of learned what panic attacks were with her and got some insight into what was going on. And so I've done therapy on and off throughout my adult life and it's been hugely helpful. Most recently, I found a lot of help with EMDR therapy for some trauma, but um, that's been hugely, hugely helpful. Um, yeah, I think. When I'm curious, when was it that you finally like connected with the therapist and figured out what the heck was going on and learned like this is panic attacks and here how here's how we can start approaching it. Hmm. I was probably in my early twenties. Um, and you know, a lot of the advice that I got was (laughs) to feel the fear and do it anyway, which, you know, in some ways is great advice, but then in some ways, like I am like the queen of white knuckling, or Mm -hmm. I should say I I was before (laughs) panic to peace. Um, I mean, I walk white knuckled my way through, life. I mean, for so long. Um, and I actually even had a therapist tell me that one time, like that I was just white. She could tell I was just white knuckling through everything. Um, and so it's really interesting just, you know, learning in panic to peace. Like it's, it's not that simple. It's not that simple of like, feel the fear and do it anyway. Like there's, there's some techniques you can use. There's some writing it out and not, you know, not resisting so much. Like it's not just feel the fear and white knuckle it. Like Mm -hmm. it's been hugely helpful for me to feel that fear and kind of allow it to be there and, and not resist and know that my body will regulate itself, that the panic will pass, that I can get through it, um, without fighting it so much. That's been a huge, I guess, like tool that I've been able to use. Yeah. I'm so glad that you shared that and ha- have that honesty or had that honesty with yourself of I was white knuckling it through everything because I think it's hard with the messaging that's out there surrounding especially panic disorder and agoraphobia recovery. It is very much of a mentality of you just got to do it. You just got to take the fear with you, do it. And it can be really harmful for a lot of people who struggle with some perfectionism and achieving type behaviors where you're like, okay, this is what everyone's telling me to do. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it no matter what at all costs. And you find yourself even more 
anxious, even more overwhelmed. And then you're convinced it's not working. I'm not getting better. Why isn't this working? And like you said, there's so many other approaches and, and, and approaching it in a healthy way for you and where you're at. Like you said, some people, it does work depending on where you're at in your journey. But for a lot of people, that approach can be incredibly harmful. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, I think for so long, like trying to white knuckle, I felt like such a failure because it was like, feel the fear and do it anyway. And so then you assume, or maybe you're told like eventually it will subside or will go away the more you do these things. But yeah, if there's no, you know, I think if you're constantly, or for me, constantly resisting, it didn't really let me like work through it. And, you know, just telling myself, you're fine, you're good, everything's okay, you're fine. Like when I, when I didn't feel like I was, it doesn't really like set you up for success, like in the future to go back and do that same thing. You know, I was still resisting, you know, um, like if I was in a scenario where I had panicked and then I tried to go back and do that thing again, I just didn't really feel like I had the tools. Um, so yeah. Yeah. It's like what you said when you were talking about college, right? It was really incredibly hard to sit there and take exams and it wasn't about the exam. It was how can I get through this without panicking? Mm -hmm. And that's so much of how we approach things because we have this mentality of I just got to do it and I can't panic, right? I can't let it go there because who knows, right? What could happen in that resistance sort of just fuels this. And so it sounds like, right, you walked through so much of your journey. I mean, our stories are fairly similar that like years and years, right, of this resistance and avoidance and this fighting against it and you find, okay, this isn't working. (laughs) Like what am I doing or what, what can I change? I'm curious, like, Was there any point throughout your journey, like when you started going to therapy, like did some pieces start to connect for you back then? Yeah, definitely. Um, And, you know, for me, I think some of it is definitely related to childhood, Mm -hmm. but I also think that a lot of it is the panic attack itself. And like we you talk about in Panic to Peace a little bit, like sometimes those panic attacks themselves are like traumatic enough to create so much avoidance. And so, you know, that was kind of a new concept for me in Panic to Peace because I had been told so much that a lot of the anxiety was really related to childhood. And and I definitely think some of it is, but also thinking like these panic attacks that I've had in in spot in places like those were it's really, really so, so scary. And so sometimes it is kind of about Like, I guess some pieces were put together in therapy and kind of realizing, I guess, hmm, like childhood definitely contributed and here's why. That's definitely very enlightening. Um, But then I also think it, it, it was enlightening as well to learn that sometimes it's not only about that. Like sometimes it is also about kind of what you've gone through dealing with the panic and agoraphobia as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And for some people, right, there's so many other pieces too. But yeah, it's not – it would be so nice, right, if you sort of knew and had this understanding, okay, it's just this or it's just this, just these two things. And now I can sort of go at it and fix it. (laughs) It's just not quite that simple. Um, But I'm curious, right, you struggled with anxiety, panic, as a, you know, a child and then as a teenager in your younger adult years, did you meet your husband while you were struggling? Um, I did actually. So we met when I was in my early twenties. Um, and it's funny because I was struggling very badly at that time. And, um, sometimes we talk about this one time where we were at a concert and, um, I was so, so anxious and I wanted to leave early because I, we were just dating. We had kind of, it was early on in the relationship and I really wanted to leave this concert early because I was feeling so, so anxious. And so I think I like told him I didn't feel well or something. And so we left and then we actually broke up for like six or seven years, stayed friends and then got back together in our late (laughs) twenties. Wow. 
Yeah. And so, um, he asked me about that at some point in the last several years. And I was like, yeah, that was, that was because I was afraid I was going to have a panic attack. And it was this concert that was like, um, you know, it was a small concert with like a big band. And so it, getting the tickets was difficult. And so I remember he thought, he's like, I thought you were so excited to be there. And so it was shocking when you wanted to leave early. And so it's, it's interesting because I think I hit it so, so, mm-hmm. so well. I became an expert as well at hiding it um, just to get through life without without people knowing because I was so embarrassed and so ashamed. Um, and especially with him, you know, because I liked him and I didn't want him to, to see that part of me. Um, so that's been a, a journey as well with him. Like, you know, it's taken many years for him to kind of, well, I'll say for me to be open to being vulnerable with him. And that's something I've talked with you about is you've been really helpful with um, just being honest and open and, and not ashamed because I think that made things so hard for him. I mean, it was hard for me, but hard for him too, because he wanted to be there. He wanted to help. And I was so ashamed that anytime it would come up, I would almost, you know, I would be irritable because I was anxious. And so it would almost turn into an argument and he would just take shots in the dark of like how to handle me as well when I was panicking too, like in the throes of a panic attack. And for so many years, it it was, it was a struggle because he was trying so hard to help and I was resisting him and resisting being honest of what was happening um, or even being fearful before we went somewhere and not just being open and saying like, I'm feeling anxious. And, um, so yeah, it's, that's been a journey as well, but I definitely think being vulnerable and not ashamed, um, has been hugely helpful. Yeah. I, gosh, there's so much here, but I think being able to finally speak some of that shame out loud, cause we know, right? Like shame gets so much power from not being spoken and, you, myself, so many others on the journey, right, have this coping mechanism that, that you know, it takes a lot of practice to undo this. You have your walls up. You don't want anyone to see it. You don't want anyone to actually know how bad it is. And I think it's partly because it's really hard to own it for yourself of like how hard it is and where you're at, but it's really scary to let other people see it. And you feel like what what happens when they see it? You know, are they how are they going to react? Are they still going to want to be around? And it's just it's so it's so beautiful, right? When the person on the other end is like, I I want to see it. I want to help you. I need you to tell me how I can actually help you. And part of that is developing that vulnerability and expressing like, here's actually what's going on because. Like you said, I think so many people do that of whether you're dating or in a relationship or in a long-term relationship and like married, we have a tendency to hide all that really hard stuff. And it makes it really hard for us to get the support because the other person doesn't understand. They can't understand what's going on, especially if you're not communicating any of it. But they're also like, you know, I if I don't know, I can't help. And if I don't know how to help, I, I definitely can't help. So all of those pieces, like there's so much of it that has to come together. But I think that first step is actually allowing yourself to speak the shame out loud, to be vulnerable, to say like, this is actually what's going on. And I know it's so hard because you're like you, it's that coping mechanism of I'm just going to pretend like I'm fine and everything's fine and I'm I'm going to get through this. And years after years of doing it, you're like, okay, <laughs> Maybe this isn't actually working. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. And it's, you know, looking back, it's like, man, I spent so many years trying to hide it and cover Mm -hmm. it up and be ashamed of it. And, you know, it's not something I like tell everyone about, but I think telling the people you're closest with, your friends or your family or your spouse or boyfriend you know, as hard as it is to admit, like, I might need your help in these moments or, you know, this thing that is so easy for you is like so, so hard mm. for me. <laughs> yeah, like, um, I think that's, 
it's that was so so that was really hard for me to admit that you know because Jamie's very like adventurous and adrenaline junkie and you know a lot of fun and I love having fun with him but these things that are so easy and so fun for him are sometimes really really hard for me and he doesn't you know he doesn't understand it and so yeah I, I definitely think it you know it was kind of up to me to be open and honest so that he could try so mm-hmm. That's been hugely helpful. And an, another thing, kind of on another note too, like I've also noticed people like I get so, so nervous going to the doctor's office. Um, so of course my blood pressure is always super high and my heart rate's really high. And so they always kind of look at me funny, you know, like, are you okay? And a lot of times I've tried to hide it. But recently when I went for like just a checkup, um, I told the girl that the nurse that – um I was feeling really, really anxious and I didn't express that I was like on the verge of a panic attack, but I did say, (laughs) I'm really, really nervous and I'm feeling really anxious. And, um, and she was so sweet, you know, and she took the cuff off and she laughed with me and joked with me for a minute and took my blood pressure and heart rate again. And of course it had gone down. So I think also like the kindness of people that you may not even know, like, you know, it's hard and it's, it's, it can be embarrassing to admit, you know, but like in that scenario, she also was like, Oh, I get nervous going to the doctor too. And, you know, people can relate sometimes that you don't even realize can relate to you. And so that's also been a little, been something I, you know, maybe have been working on a little bit too, is, is when I'm feeling vulnerable, feeling okay, telling people, and they may not always, yes, they may not always respond like how you want them to, but then there's also that knowing that even if they don't, like I'll still, I'll still be okay, but it's a bonus if they do. And it feels really great. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It's so cool when we give ourselves the opportunities and we do actually see like, oh, dang, that was helpful. (laughs) Like why, why didn't I try that sooner? But it's just, it speaks to you, right? So many people, especially I think when you're struggling with an anxiety disorder, you don't give yourself any leeway to feel anxious. You always see anxiety as being a problem. I can't feel this way. Why am I feeling this way again? I'm just so silly. And you're like, you don't slow down enough to recognize so many people get anxious about going to the doctor. So many people get anxious about traveling and going on public transportation and flying and all of these things. And it's okay. It's okay. And a lot of times it makes sense that you have anxiety about it. But we get so caught up in those dang stories of like, but I shouldn't be feeling this way. This is so ridiculous. And, you know, we add to all that resistance. So something I feel like we definitely like passed by and didn't really talk about, (laughs) which I want to talk about, is how anxiety actually manifests for you? Because I think it does look differently. There are some commonalities, of course, but it can look differently for a lot of people. So I know you had the panic attack, right? And it being centered a lot around this feeling trapped and stuck and, oh my gosh, what if this happens? I can't let that happen. But what else did it look like for you? Yeah. So um, a lot of my does have to do with being trapped. So, um, like flying is, is difficult for me. And, um, you know, it's not really a lot of fears that people may have with flying for me. It's, it is, it's being trapped. It's feeling claustrophobic. Um, once I'm in there, I'm usually totally fine, but the kind of like sitting in the seat, waiting to take off the, the waiting and the like, okay, let you know, I get really anxious about that. Um, I also, struggle with, um, or have struggled in the past really with like being far away from home. So whether that's walking or driving, um, you know, feeling, even if I'm in a familiar place, like I live back in my hometown now, but in the past, like even being very familiar with all of the areas around where I live, if I would kind of go farther out, even in a familiar spot, like, because I was farther away from home, like home has always been my safe space and safe place. Um, not that I've never panicked at home, but it's always kind of been (laughs) the safe spot. Um, definitely some driving anxiety, like driving on the interstate highways, um, getting stuck in traffic 
is, is a huge, huge anxiety trigger for me. Um, that one is kind of one that I'm still working on, but has definitely gotten so, so much better. Um, but yeah, being stuck like on the interstate in traffic is, that's a scary one. Um, I get, I guess that's kind of like that trapped feeling of like, if I need to get out of here, I can't, I can't go anywhere. Um, that's, that's a lot of mine, I think. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting, right? Cause I know a bit of like where you've been at recently and I would love to, if you're comfortable to sort of share, cause I know you really are somebody who wants to live this adventurous life and do these cool and fun things. And of course you have a partner <laughs> similar to mine of like <laughs> seemingly super carefree and <laughs> never anxious and like, let's just do all the crazy things. So I know you recently went on a trip and although it was anxiety producing, it was really cool to hear how it was different than it typically had been. So if you feel comfortable, like I'd love for you to share that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so I was really nervous about going on the trip. We went to Colorado, so we flew. Um, and actually, so we flew into Kansas city and then we road tripped eight hours to Colorado. So there was a lot of opportunities for, um, triggers for anxiety. Um, and, um, you know, the way up there, the flight was really smooth. I don't think I told you this, but there were only 32 people on our flight. So it was like the best flight ever. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So easy. Um, a quick flight to from here. And then, yeah, I had a moment of kind of like a little health thing that came up when I was in Kansas city and I got super nervous and wanted to stay in Kansas city so that I could go to a dentist because I was kind of like getting really, really anxious. Um, and you know, in the past I, it can definitely say that I probably would have spiraled and not really been able to do much on this trip. Um, in Kansas city, I, I definitely think in the past I would have probably either wanted to stay home or obsessed and obsessed and obsessed about what was going on. Um, but this time was different because that's not really what I did. Um, I was definitely nervous, but I was still able to enjoy the trip with my husband and some of his family. And then, you know, he was, because I've been able to be more vulnerable with him, <laughs> he was really able to like talk me through, um, just kind of, uh, I guess, or we were able to talk through kind of how I was feeling <clears throat> and what was going on. And he, you know, he really encouraged me like, no, let's, let's go ahead and keep going on our, you know, continue on our road trip. Um, and we did, and everything thankfully turned out totally fine. Um, and we drove eight hours to Colorado and I struggle with altitude sickness. And so, you know, I was really nervous about that, but instead of kind of letting it consume me and the anxiety about it take over and being worried about what if I get sick and like, what if, you know, I don't feel well and what if I ruin this trip because that was a big one. Um, you know, I was able to, you know, take some pain reliever medicine when my head started to hurt and continue on. And we had a really, really great time. Um, there were a couple of other moments that came up. Um, we were going to a concert and I, kind of told you about this one. This makes me laugh. Um, and this is kind of something I do that, um, do working with Shannon, I think figured out is a coping mechanism, but, um, we were going to this concert and so we had to park kind of far away and then walk, stand in line for a while and then go into this really crowded, um, amphitheater. And the whole time, leading up to it. You know, I had been on the trip for several days at this point. I was kind of tired. I was, you know, I was feeling really anxious because I was so excited about this concert and really, really wanted to have a good time and get in there. And we couldn't find a place to park. And so I was just feeling really overwhelmed. And I kept telling my husband, like, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't park and walk. I can't stand in this line. I can't go in this crowded amphitheater. Um, you know, crowds are definitely a struggle for me as well as far as like how my anxiety manifests. Um, 
I usually would be like looking for exits. Like I got to get out of the crowd, even if I'm in the back of somewhere. Um, but so anyway, I kept saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. Um, all the while I was doing it, like we parked, <laughs> we walked, I stood in line, uh, we got into the amphitheater. And so, but that whole time, you know, I felt the anxiety like really coming up and like my chest was tight and I felt like I was having to take like really deep breaths and I could feel myself kind of getting like shaky and um, just, just really, really overwhelmed. And the whole while saying I couldn't do it, I was actually doing it. And it was really hard. Like it, it wasn't perfect. And, you know, looking back, like there are times where, you know, I kind of wish maybe like I would have handled it a little bit better, but I got through it and I got into the concert and had an absolutely amazing, amazing time. Um, so you know, that looks different as well, because honestly, in the past, I think I would have just left. I think I would have really just said, I can't do it and not even tried. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but the, the, the best part of the story, and it's kind of crazy because it involves a full blown panic attack, <laughs> but it is the best part is that on the way home, um, on the plane, <laughs> this makes me a little emotional. Um, I did start to panic and <laughs> instead of like resisting, like I've always done like so, so hard. I, I remember like I, I reached down for the Xanax because that's my instinct. And I said, you know what? It's not going to kick in fast enough anyway. And also I want to try, like, I really want to try my techniques and my tools that I've learned today. And so I let it come and I like, wrote it out and it was, it was hard. And like my heart was pounding so fast. I thought it was going to beat out of my chest and I felt shaky. And all I wanted to do was like, get up and say, please, like, I, I, I don't want to be on this plane anymore. But instead of doing that, I, I sat there and I wrote it out and like, I let it happen. And, you know, in that moment, I kind of just took a deep breath and told myself, my body will re-regulate itself. My breathing will go back to normal. My heart rate will slow down. You know, and of course in the moment it's not perfect. Like there was some fear and and then the what ifs came in like, well, what if it doesn't? And then I did calm down and then everything did kind of re-regulate. And then I still had a what if thought of like, but what if this happened? What if happens again? You know, we were sitting on the on the plane like and it had been like 30 minutes and we hadn't taken off and you know, I was starting to feel antsy and thought, what if it happens again? And I was like, but I just got through it. I can do it again. Like that, that wasn't as maybe, I don't know, as hard as they have been in the past. And it was still difficult and it was still really uncomfortable, but writing it out and just kind of letting it happen without resisting and not telling myself, you're fine. You're okay. Everything's fine. You're going to be fine. And more just, you know, okay, anxiety, like you're here. I see you like I'm uncomfortable, but I'm going to breathe and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to just kind of let you be here. And then it did. And then it went away. (laughs) Imagine that, right? (laughs) It's so cool. Like there's so much that you shared there. That's so cool. I think, you know, you said, this trip rate right, was to give me opportunities and you had so many opportunities to practice having healthy responses and to really do things in a healthy way rather than the white knuckling and doing things how they traditionally looked. And I'm just so proud of you because I know it's not easy. And, and I mean, on this trip, right, you had so many things like a flight, a road trip, you know, just so many different changes and a concert and you spent a lot of time outdoors and canoeing and like just so many things and you did an amazing job of working through all of it and also having a really good time and oh it's just so cool it's it's really cool when you start seeing people building that trust back within themselves and actually feeling more confident and knowing like okay I'm I am shifting this relationship with anxiety. Maybe, maybe I can live more fully because I think that's one of the things I remembered. It always 
differences in what people say when they start the program like always stand out for me. And I remember yours being like, I don't feel like I'm living as fully as I could be. And I think so many people share that, right? Like I know that there's more. I know that there's more for me. I know that this doesn't have to look, this doesn't have to be how it looks. And really wanting to give yourself yourself the opportunity to actually have life look how you want it to. Like that's a big part of what we have to own that yeah. it doesn't, the life doesn't just happen and it isn't just, you know, it doesn't just land in our laps. Like we have to actually create it. And you're allowing yourself to have those opportunities to create this fuller life that you want, which is so, so cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's very true. Um, that when I did decide to take the course, that was um, kind of a, a big motivation for me. Like I had felt like it kind of hit a little bit of a plateau in like my healing and therapy and feeling like, you know, everything was helping, but I just wasn't, I felt like there was kind of like another little piece to the puzzle that like I needed to just kind of, I guess, um, fit in that I, I hadn't had. And so, you know, this trip was so different than others. And I guess I should add that the last time I flew before this trip, I did have a panic attack on a plane and it looked so different. And I think that's why it makes me emotional because then going into this trip, I was, I was terrified. I was so terrified it was going to happen again. And then, you know, when it did on the way home, it looked so different. And so I think that's, I should add that there that, you know, I, I was kind of afraid I wasn't going to be able to like ever fly again, or at least do it without this so much anxiety that it was like nearly impossible. So now it's really cool because, you know, when I think about going on another trip, like I'm not as scared. So I'm like, I, I can do it. Like I did it. <laughs> you uh, know? Like, And it wasn't. Yeah. Go. Yeah. It's so good. It's so good. I think you just hit on something so good that I really want people to hear because I think our brains have this way, right, of bringing up past memories and bringing up instances where it did look really bad and hard. And our brains are very good at sticking to those things. And of course, when you go along with it, you're just like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. Like, why would I do that? I'm not going to have – a panic attack like that again on a plane or that far from home or in a car, like all the things, but you have to actually let it look differently. You have to actually allow yourself to create new memories of what it can look like. And sure, you, you know, you're going to have those thoughts pop in, you're going to have that fear, but you've got to allow yourself to to have the opportunities for it to look differently. And that's exactly what you did. You know, it doesn't have to look like that. Last time I had a panic attack on the plane and how I felt and how hard that was, it can look differently. And now you've shown yourself that. And it's not to say you'll never have, you know, a panic attack again on a plane and it won't be hard. It's not that. It's actually being able to see I can and it can be hard, but it doesn't have to look that bad. Like I can actually get through it. And it's not something that I have to fear. It's not something that I have to prevent myself from living. That's the best thing, right? When you have that knowing, like, I don't, I don't want to prevent myself from living anymore, but I also don't have to. Yeah, definitely. And, and kind of what you said too, about um, like creating new, new memories and that things don't have to look like they used to. Um, like another, another thing that I kind of forgot to mention is like my anxiety definitely manifests as like, what if thoughts? Mm. So of course it's like, what if I panic and embarrass myself on this plane? Or like, you know, what if I'm in a canoe, you know, on my trip and I panic in this thing? What am I, am I going to fall in the water? Am I going to jump in the water? (laughs) It's cold and I'm going to like get sick. And, you know, um, and so I think like, that's a huge thing too, that has been extremely, extremely helpful. Like when you and I have, um, met and then also in panic to peace is talking about like, like watching the stories that you're telling yourself and paying attention to those. And so, you know, in my head, instead of 
and that's been a huge thing I've done kind of like day to day as well. Instead of saying like, well, what if I panic in the grocery store and like, I have to leave my basket or I like embarrass myself and my face gets super red and people are like, what is wrong with her? You know, it's like, well, what if I go in there and like, I, and, and I feel anxious or panicky and I let that kind of come over me and I acknowledge that it's there. And I'm like, yeah, I see you. I, you're, you can come with me, you know, but you're not going to make the decisions for me today. And, you know, what if I look at it like that instead and, mm -hmm. and, and the what ifs become like, or one thing you even told me was instead of what if, think like, even if, like, even if I panic, I'll be okay. Like, even if the anxiety comes, I know that like, I can ride it out. And, you know, so yeah, I think that's a huge, hugely helpful thing for me as well is, is just really, really paying attention to those what if thoughts. Um, cause you know, like you and I had talked about, like, just because I panicked on a plane once doesn't mean that it has to look the same way the next time, you know? And so, yeah, that's been hugely helpful. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm so glad that you brought that up because so many people, <laughs> I think, struggling with panic and agoraphobia, it's the what ifs, the, yeah. the constant. And you feel like it's really, really tough because they're thoughts and you can't stop your thoughts. And so it's like, what the heck do I do with all of these what ifs? And I, I'm glad that you gave those insights. And you know, I think it, this goes back to sort of what we talked about in the beginning, right? Allowing yourself to do things differently. It doesn't have to look like just facing the fears and doing the things and white knuckling your way through it. Like there are other really helpful and healthy shifts that are actually going to help you for when you're facing your fears. And you have to feel equipped. You have to actually be equipped. You can't just force yourself to do all the things and, you know, but like, you know, in, in the Panic to Peace program, usually in the beginning, people are like, okay, and when are we going to get to like yes. facing our fears and, and the exposures? And I'm like, nope, not for a while, not for a while. And there's a very good reason for it. So I'm so glad you have shared so many amazing insights and just you being so incredibly vulnerable and sharing your story. I super appreciate it. And I know people are going to take so much out of it. So Thank you so much, Angel, for coming on. I have loved every second of this conversation. Thank you so much. I'm I'm so glad you asked me and I'm so glad, like I feel honored to be able to share my story and I really hope that it can help someone who might be struggling out there. Yeah, it for sure will. So I always ask, right, if somebody's listening right now and they're like, I am panicking all the time. Like the anxiety is just constant. I feel like my life is never going to look any differently. Like how the heck am I going to get in a better place and create this healthy relationship with anxiety? What would you offer to that person? Um, I would say there is definitely hope. There is definitely um, help out there. I think, you know, Panic to Peace was really, really helpful for me. And, and it takes time, you know, like you were just saying, like, it takes time to feel equipped. Like for a long time, I didn't. And even when I started Panic to Peace, like I had done some healing and some work, but, you know, even some of the things that you mentioned or some of the things that other people mentioned they were able to do, I was like, I'm just not there yet, you know? And so be patient with yourself and understand that it takes time to heal and that it's also not linear. Like, some days you feel on top of the world and some days are really still hard when it comes to like anxiety or panic and what you feel able to do. So yeah, just knowing that it takes time and being patient and, and knowing that there is hope and that there are other ways to maybe heal and work on the anxiety than what you've been traditionally told. I mean, those things can definitely be helpful and there's a lot of value in, in, in all the techniques, I, I suppose, but I think just knowing that there's, there's, there's more to learn. Um, but yeah, be patient with yourself, be kind to yourself. That's another mm -hmm. thing that's been huge. Like, um, just be kind and compassionate to yourself and know that you're doing the best that you can. And, um, yeah, that, that you'll, you'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you again so much, Angel. Thank you. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Healthy Push. If you want more, head on over to ahealthypush.com for the show notes and lots more tips, tools, and inspiration that will support your recovery. And if you're hoping for me to cover a certain topic, be sure to join my Instagram community at A Healthy Push and let me know in the comments what you want to hear next.